Question 16 asks us to consider what's, what are the essential attributes of moral rights. So that's, a, that's pretty much a definitional question to understand what moral rights are. So are moral rights universal? Yep, uh, everyone has them. Can we transfer moral rights? Uh, no, we can't transfer them, so that's true. Are moral rights equal? Well, everyone has the same amount. Uh, we're all entitled. Uh, we all have the same amount of the rights, so yes, they are equal. And are they natural? Well, the, someone who believes in moral rights actually argue, yes, they are naturally uh, present. So uh, they would all be true, which leads us to answer E is, is the correct answer. All of the above are essential attributes of moral rights. Question 17. Jack and Jill are both lawyers and work for Tallet Proprietary Limited and Leehart Limited, respectively. Tallet Proprietary Limited and Leehart Limited are currently in a dispute regarding a construction contract the business has entered into over 12 months ago. Neither party wants to go to court because the costs can be extremely high. So Jack and Jill decide to employ a neutral third party to hear their arguments and who will then suggest a resolution to their problems. However, Jack and Jill also agree that any such decision by the third party will not be binding on their business. Okay, so this is really an alternative dispute resolution um, problem. Now, we know that litigation is where they actually go to court. And it says here, neither party wants to go to court, so it can't be litigation. Negotiation is where the two parties try and work it out themselves, but they don't have anyone else involved. So it can't be that one because they want to get um, a third party involved. So we're down to arbitration and conciliation. Um, arbitration means that the third party's decision or suggestion would be binding on them. Okay, But here, they don't want it to be binding, so it can't be arbitration. So it's actually conciliation. That's our answer, D. Um, it's conciliation also because the party is actively involved. And in fact, a conciliation would be a better answer than mediation where the parties, where the third party just helps people explore the problem. That's the other term that's not in that question to make it a bit clearer in terms of what the answer is, which is conciliation where a third party will suggest resolutions. Question 18. Which of the following statements would best describe someone who's using an egoist approach to solve an ethical dilemma? Okay, so what's an egoist approach? It means that ethically, the right thing to do is what's good for you. So that's what we're looking in these scenarios. Is it good for the decision maker? Tom is a company director and believes there is an absolute right to freedom of speech. Well, that sounds like a moral rights issue. And all employees should be able to speak their mind regardless of the consequences. Notice it also doesn't speak about what's happening for Tom. So that's not going to be our answer. That's a rights answer. Maria believes in employing staff whose virtues align with hers so that she knows staff will make decisions that she thinks are right. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting one. But notice it's about what she thinks is right, not what's good for her. So while it sounds a bit egoist, this sounds a bit more like virtue ethics, that she's looking for virtuous people. And her definition of virtuous is what she sees as virtuous. But a virtuous person might make decisions that aren't good for her. So it's not going to be that answer. Brendan will give his staff a Christmas bonus as it makes him feel good to see his staff smile. Why is Brendan doing it? Because it makes him feel good. So that really sounds the most egoist we've come to. I, I, I like C as our answer. Let's just have a look at D to make sure. Christian decided that his business should not operate on a Sunday as his staff would be very unhappy and this would only provide a very small benefit to the local community. So notice A, Christian isn't talking about himself and he seems to be assessing the happiness, the happiness of his staff compared, well, the unhappiness of his staff compared to the happiness or the benefit to the community. So that looks like a utilitarian approach. So I go back and go, well, that's right. That's a rights approach. That's a virtues approach. 
that's a utilitarian approach, and yeah, that's an egoist approach. C would be our answer. Which of the following statements about normative ethical theories is correct? A person who applies egoism will never do anything that would provide a benefit to another person. Well, we know that that's not correct because an egoist might do something that will benefit someone else if it also benefits themselves. Virtue ethics requires that you find the mean for all stakeholders involved and determine which will give you the best outcome. Truly, I don't even know what that sentence means, find the mean for all stakeholders. Virtue ethics is about finding the mean, the golden mean of the virtue between two vices, uh, nothing to do with stakeholders. So that's mixing virtue ethics and um, utilitarianism by the sound of it. So I, 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 it's not B. Utilitarianism says that the right thing to do is to act in a way that provides the greatest benefit for an individual. Well, no, we have to add up the happiness and unhappiness of everyone involved, all the stakeholders. So for utilitarianism, that isn't true. In fact, that sounds like uh, an egoist. Kant says there's an absolute duty called the categorical imperative, which applies in all situations and does not depend on any particular circumstances. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's Kant. So I'm going with D is a pretty clear answer there uh, among those options. Question 20. Judge Livingston is a judge of the Queensland District Court. In one case that Judge Livingston is presiding over, the barrister for the plaintiff cites three cases. All three are in favour of the plaintiff. The cases are a case decided in the Supreme Court of New South Wales on similar facts, a case decided in the Magistrates Court of Queensland on similar facts, a case decided in the Supreme Court of Queensland on similar facts. Which of these cases, if any, must Judge Livingston follow? Well, remember that the doctrine of... This is a question about the doctrine of precedent. The doctrine of precedent says you've got to follow cases of the courts that are higher than you in your hierarchy. Okay, so where, where, we've got to look, where does the District Court of Queensland sit in relation to these other courts. Well, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, well, that's a different hierarchy, right? So we don't have to follow that one, or Judge Livingston doesn't have to follow that one. The Magistrates Court of Queensland, well, that's lower than the District Court, right? That's, uh, that's below the District Court, so we don't have to follow that decision. The Supreme Court of Queensland, yes, that is higher and in the hierarchy, the Supreme Court is above the District Court. So we would have to follow a case decided in the Supreme Court on similar facts. So that's the answer I'm looking for, the Supreme Court of Queensland. So our answer would be A, right? It's not B, it's not C. We do have to follow A, which means D is out. So A is our clear answer. Again, let's just have a bit of a pause before we hit those final questions. <laughs> 